two seconds. Good morning. Good morning. May 4th, 2020, meeting of the Cumberland County Commissioners will please come to order. First order of business is our invocation and pledge of allegiance. I'd like to call on Vice Chairman Glenn Adams. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to stand up. Y'all uh, don't have to stand, but I'm just here. Uh, Vice Chairman, if we could just have a moment of silence after the meeting, I know that the governor is firing our flags to have staff in honor of uh, Senator Tony Rand, who was the uh, instrumental in a lot of things that happened in this county. So uh, just a few moments of uh, a moment of silence for uh, Senator Rand and especially for his family uh, in this trying time. Thank you. Dear Father, we come today just saying thank you. We want to thank you for this wonderful, beautiful day you've given us. We want to thank you for all of the people that are involved in this meeting. We'd ask you to touch their heart as we leave everything decent and in order. Father, we want to thank you for protecting all of our citizens uh, here in Cumberland County. Thank you for the staff who has done a tremendous job during this time of crisis. We'd ask that you use, uh, that you put your angels around us and protect us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We can, Amen. Uh, <laughs> I believe it is to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Vice Chairman Adams. Uh, first item of business is our approval of agenda. Uh, County Manager, is there any additions or no change to the agenda. Is there a motion? I move we approve the agenda. There a second. Moved and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. have it. Next item of business, uh, Ms. Cannon. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Commissioners. Item two are our presentations. We thought it was appropriate to, again, have an update by Dr. Jennifer Green on the uh, COVID-19 local activities. And we also thought it would be appropriate to have our emergency services director, Jean Booth, uh, present. So we'll start with Dr. Jennifer Green. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning, thank you for having me. I will Good start morning. with the disclaimer that I gave each time, and that is that this is a rapidly evolving situation and that the data on these slides are updated as of yesterday. And these are data from the Centers for Disease Control and the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Before we jump into the data, I want to provide two updates about questions that we get frequently. One is about the symptoms for COVID, and then the second is um, some updates about testing and the types of testing that are available. 
So the first update is about the symptoms. So um, as we know, symptoms for COVID typically appear two to 14 days after um, somebody has been exposed to the virus. And in the beginning, we were talking primarily about a cough and shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. And those things are also true, uh, are, are still true, but we are also finding a number of other symptoms that might be uh, present for somebody that tests positive. And so the CDC, as of last week, added some additional information to their website about other symptoms. And, the, and so um, coughing and shortness of breath or at least two of these symptoms, a fever, um, a chills, repeated shaking when you have chills, um, muscle pain, headache, uh, sore throat, and a new loss of taste or smell. And so we're hearing about that much more frequently, the loss of taste or smell. And we frequently get questions about children. We know that children typically have mo more mild symptoms than adults, um, but they're still important because our children might, um, we might not notice that they have those symptoms and then they pass that on to an older adult a member of their family. So those are some additional symptoms that we're hearing about um, in recent days. I wanna provide a quick um, overview of the two types of testing that we're hearing about and, um, and tell you how we're dealing with that locally. And so there are two types of tests that are available for COVID. One is a viral test, um, and then the second is the antibody test. So the viral test is the one that we are using at the health, that's being used at the state health department lab, that's generally used by most of our laboratories here and locally. Um, and around the country. And so that is the diagnostic viral test. The second type is the antibody test. And um, we are aware of, of, of a provider or two in our community that's using the antibody test. And the antibody test um, may tell you that you've had a past infection, um, but it may not be able to tell you if you have a current infection. And that's primarily because it can take one to three weeks um, before your after symptoms occur, before your body begins to make those antibodies. So that is not a diagnostic test, um, but is being used much more for surveillance. And we don't yet know if having those antibodies, if I get sick and I have those antibodies, if, I, if it can protect someone from me um, from getting it again in the future. Um, we think that, but we don't know that for sure yet and we don't know how long that protection will last. So if I get sick, how long will that protect me from getting it again? So importantly, if somebody has a positive antibody test, we're not using that for a diagnosis, and it's not included in their case count um, because we can't use that as a diagnostic test for current infection. Um, so those are the two quick updates I wanted to provide before we jump into the data. Um, so nationally, we are over at uh, over a million cases of COVID uh, uh, um, U.S. wide and over 60,000 um, deaths here in this country. Uh, hospitalizations around the country are declining in, in certain areas of our country, um, but it remains high in other areas, include, in particular on the Northeast. Um, those are, are higher. Um, and as, as we've said in previous meetings, the hospitalizations are highest among those uh, that are 65 and older. And importantly, and you'll hear me talk about this a little bit in the, in the future um, in, a, in a couple of slides, we look at um, COVID-like illness, and we also look at influenza-like illness, so ILI. Uh, we hear this is we do flu surveillance every year. Um, uh, from the CDC, and it also happens at the state level. So we can compare our COVID-like illness with our influenza-like illness and hospitalizations. Um, if we look at it over the last five years, the fa last five influenza seasons, uh, hospitalization rates for COVID-19 are at a higher rate for um, COVID than at comparable points in, this, in the season for influenza for the past five years. So we are making some progress, um, but not quite there yet. Um, some key points in, in North Carolina, I wanna present the data in a little bit different way than we've done in the past. Um, the North Carolina, and you've heard the governor talk about this, they're looking at some key metrics as we reopen and we're tracking these same, these same metrics. 
So uh, North Carolina is looking at the um, COVID-like illness surveillance. So you just heard me talk about influenza-like illness, ILI surveillance. We're doing the same thing for COVID. We want to see a decline in those in that number of COVID-like illness, and that's done at, in emergency departments. We also want to see a decline or the leveling in lab confirmed cases. We also want to look at a decline in positive tests as a percentage of total tests. So we know that um, as we ramp up testing, that we will have an increase in cases. But we also can look at the total number of tests that we do, and we want to see a decline in the percentage of total of positive tests as a percentage of total tests. Of course, we want to see a decline in the number of hospitalizations, and then the state has set a goal to do five to 7,000 tests daily, and we'll talk about what that looks like locally. And then the state has also requested, or it has a goal of having 250 contact tracers each day, and we'll talk about what that looks like locally as well. And the state also has a goal of a 30-day supply of personal protective equipment. So we're not going to go over every metric today for the sake of time, but I want to encourage um, those that are listening in to go to the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. They have a great dashboard, and you can track each of these metrics um, uh, on their website. And I just have an excerpt of, those, of that data today, and then we'll look at it locally. So in terms of um, the number of cases, so the goal is to have a downward trajectory or a sustained trajectory of cases, of, of new cases um, by day. So this data is updated as of, as of last, uh, as of this weekend. And so we can see that there's an increase in um, cases reported by day. And there's a little curve at the end that looks like it's just declining, but we have not seen a down tra downward trajectory over the last 14 days. So this is an area where we have not yet met that metric, and we want to see us turn the corner so we can have that downward trajectory, but we're not there yet in terms of numbers of new cases. The next metric is to look at the number of the percentage of positive tests as a percentage of the total tests. So if you look at this is updated um, as a 5-1, so you can see that we do have a, um, a downward trajectory as of the percentage of tests as a total, a positive test as a percentage of the total test. So we are getting fewer, we are doing more testing, but we are getting fewer positives. And that um, declined um, starting around the 30th of, of April last, uh, the last week. Um, about eight or seven percent of our tests are positive. And this is a number that we do not yet have locally. We are trying to work with the state health department to determine this number locally, but we just don't have that data yet. The next metric is the number the, of hospitalizations. So again, we want to see a downward trajectory in the number of people that are currently hospitalized. And so this, again, as we hear hospitals talk about reopening, um, and, and bringing back some of those elective procedures and surgeries, we want to make sure that in a surge of cases, we have the capacity to have, um, to, for our hospitals to take on if we had additional cases of COVID. So we have not yet seen that downward trajectory statewide of hospitalizations, not yet. Um, so you can see here that we're still on the incline, but it looks like in the last two days, um, we've had um, 500 on the, on the second and then 475 current hospitalizations um, statewide. So if we go back to when I did a presentation two weeks ago, um, we're just below where we were two weeks ago. So it's not, it's in, it, we have not seen that, that um, steady decline yet, um, but we're not rapidly increasing either. And then we'll talk about that local data. So the other piece that North Carolina is working on is increasing the number of tests that we do on a daily basis. And that means the number of tests that are being processed at the state laboratory and the number of tests that are being done by commercial laboratories, LabCorp, Quest, our university labs as well. 
And so we are in working to increase that between somewhere between five to 7,000 tests a day. And that number has fluctuated um, greatly over the last couple of, um, uh, across the last week or so. And so we're watching that. And then we have our own task here locally about the number of tests that we need to do to contribute to that five to 7,000 tests statewide. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, the state has also, again, wants to increase the number of contact tracers um, to 250, and I'll talk about our role in that locally. Um, there's a much more detailed chart on the State Health Department website in terms of PPE. We still have uh, PPE shortages, and there are two areas where we have shortages, and this um, reflects locally as well. So on the State Health Department website, there's a, a chart that shows the the each type of PPE and the numbers of days that we have supply. So the areas where we have shortages are in 95, we have a one day supply that's statewide and gowns, we have, a, we have zero days worth of gowns in terms of the number of requests that are being received by the state and the number that they're able to, that they have on hand to fulfill. So that reflects um, what was happening locally as well. Um, we, have, we, have, um, we are hurting for gowns and N95. And these two um, supplies are, are important because when we do testing, we have to have N95s and gowns to do, um, to do COVID-19 testing. And that, so those things are very critical, um, both statewide and locally. So I'll switch over to local data. So as you know, we have on the website um, our case counts, and then we have this broken down by age, gender, zip code, race, ethnicity, and then we have a chart that shows how we were notified cases by the notification date. I want to highlight um, a, a particular piece of information because we are getting a number of data requests. And as we try to respond to those data requests, we have to balance, um, and this is in consultation with our partners at the State Health Department and um, at the UNC School of Government. We, are, we have to balance and follow federal and state privacy guidelines and laws um, for reporting out. So we are making sure that we are aligned with those uh, federal and state privacy laws um, before we respond to any requests for data. So I encourage people to check the website, but also check the State Health Department website for data that is available there. So we are making sure that we are following all of those um, laws as we are reporting out um, our numbers. So the next, so I'll start here with our, with our Cumberland County cases. We have 292 cases here in the county, about half are female and about the average age among our cases is 44 and about 41 percent are african-american and this reflects what's going on statewide and nationally very similar in terms of the demographics um, you can see the two zip code areas where we have the highest number of cases this has not changed much um, over the last couple of, of meetings 28314 and 28304 are where we have the highest number of cases um, and we have two additional deaths since we uh, met last time. So we have eight total deaths here in our community, um, which relative to other communities, we're doing um, each loss of life in our community is critical and important to us um, in terms if we are comparing ourselves to other counties. Um, we have not seen as much death in our community as, we, as other communities have. But of course, each life is of a critical importance to us. The next slide shows the number of cases um, by, by day and it's a cumulative count. So if we look sort of in the middle of the chart here, and um, we can see where we flattened the curve a little bit and then we in, had an increase in the number of cases that we had. So we were doing pretty well in sort of, 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 wrap, of flattening the curve and then we had a, a steeper incline in the number of cases that we have community-wide. And part of that, and we'll get into the why behind that in just a moment, um, but we, we have seen a number of cases, or an increase, a substantial increase in our cases in the last couple of days, 
in the last week or so where we've had days where we've had 20 cases in a day or 30 cases in a day. Um, so we'll talk about the why behind that in just a moment. So I want to go back to the state perspective, the statewide effort, and then kind of talk about what's going on locally um, so people under, can understand how we're applying that here. So we know that the stay-at-home order was extended to Friday, May 8th, and then there are three directives happening at the state level that we are also following locally and trying to um, do our part. So one is the state, as we mentioned a few times, is trying to increase our test capacity while also conserving our personal protective equipment so that if we do have a surge at the hospital, um, that we can be prepared for that. We are also working to increase contact tracing. So contact tracing is an important part of, um, of controlling an outbreak and controlling an, a pandemic so that we can identify new cases um, and we need increased staff capacity to do contact tracing. And then the third thing is, of course, to analyze all of that trend data, the number of new cases, hospitalizations, how many deaths do we have, the PPE, um, our hospital capacity, et cetera. So we are looking at all of those things locally and you um, just got a, a brief review of what those numbers look like locally. So I'm gonna turn to a couple of other parts. Um, first, the testing. So this guidance has changed since we last met. So previously we were talking about uh, asking individuals with mild illness to stay home um, and to really focus on um, individuals that were having that severe illness. So the state health department has um, shifted the guidance just a bit, and now the state guidance includes um, clinicians consider testing for any patient for whom COVID-19 is suspected. So um, again, we're focusing primarily on those that are symptomatic, um, but we also know that somebody may be asymptomatic um, but that we have a known exposure, that person um, was exposed to somebody that um, um, has, is a positive case and we know that, that they're asymptomatic still. So um, they can consider testing for anybody, but the state health department criteria still focuses on those that are symptomatic. Hospital workers, healthcare workers, first responders, people that are in a high risk setting. Um, and then we've added a criteria including testing for those at the state laboratory for post-mortem um, specimens. So somebody that has passed away and the, and the clinician or the medical examiner um, thinks that they may be positive or thinks they have, um, could have possibly passed away from COVID-like illnesses. And so we can do testing for those. those t that testing is not happening at the health department, um, but we, are prov we can provide test kits um, to, for that testing to happen. So we are, we are following those guidelines again and at the health department by, on a case-by-case -case basis and by appointment only. So we'll talk about um, next how we are increasing our capacity, but that's a little bit of a shift since we met last, um, last meeting. So our directive from the state health department has been to increase our test, our test capacity locally. So in the past week, we've met with a number of our local healthcare agencies, our hospital, um, our urgent, some of our urgent cares, our federally qualified healthcare center, Stedman Wade, the VA, Fort Bragg, and a number of other partners um, and communicated with them to think about what is their current capacity for testing and how might we increase our capacity locally to do more testing. Um, some of the barriers and needs that we are discovering are that we um, have a limited, and both at the health department and across um, these different agencies, there's an additional need for staffing to do um, testing, and we also need additional PPE so that if we sustain this over the summer and throughout the fall, we certainly are going to need additional PPE and this morning we put in additional requests for PPE for our staff so that we can do additional testing. Um, that's one of our key barriers here and the same for the health department staff. Um, we are utilizing our, our staff for contact tracing and utilizing our staff um, for screening and doing some testing, but we are going to need to hold an additional staff to do that. Um, so we have a test capacity team 
here at the health department and we continue to strategize um, with each of our partners about how we might incrementally increase our capacity for testing, including doing mobile clinics. So we're working on that front. Um, we also know that one of our barriers is going to be um, the availability of test kits. And so we have already put in a request to the state for additional test kits and are also working with the state um, with the lab commercial laboratories to get additional test kits. And the commercial labs are working on a strat on a way that as we use the test kits, we will get more test kits. So we are working um, with them to get test kits. Um, we've had a number of questions about um, diagnostic, the availability of the rapid diagnostic test. Um, we are on the wait list for that test on the, the rapid test. We do not have it yet here at the health department. We're on the wait list and um, but the wait list is quite long. And so um, once we have it available, we will implement. We've also shared um, our test collecting, the test collection kits that we have with our congregate living facilities as needed, our VA homes and our shelters as, as needed. So we are also trying to resource test kits for other agencies. Um, the next piece I'll shift to is about our contact tracing. So you've heard me say that we, the state health department wants to increase the capacity for, for contact tracing statewide. Um, we are continuing to do contact investigations for each of our positive cases. What we've determined locally is that we need about 20 contact tracing staff daily to keep up with the number of, of with demand. And so we are trying to balance that need for con 20 plus staff for contact tracing, plus an additional 20 or so staff a day for um, testing capacity, plus being able to um, provide our regular mandated services. So we are working to um, identify ways that we can we can keep those that resource. Um, as you have heard the governor talk about in the last couple of days. They have collaborated with the um, with several agencies across the state to do to form the Carolina Community Tracing Collaborative, and they are hiring and training staff to support contact tracing efforts. Those will be available approximately May 18th, and we will be requesting um, additional staff for contact tracing. And as we do that, if we have additional state resources, we can shift some of our local resources to increasing our test capacity. So um, we still need a number of staff on site to be able to do that and including doing contact tracing on the weekends. So we're trying to, um, we'll meet today and um, again throughout the week to figure out how we can best do that. Um, so I wanna, um, wrap up with looking at uh, taking a look back at the trends and talk a little bit about the why we've seen a number of cases increased number of cases so we're closely examining um, why we are having an increased number of cases here in our community and there are a couple of things that I'm looking at when I look at the data one is that we have a decreased turnaround time at the state laboratory in the beginning of this we were looking at a week three to five days, sometimes a week to get um, test results back. We are getting those back 24, 48 hours. So that means that we are having um, more cases rapidly come, come through our state system. Um, we also know that at least one of our local providers is doing a rapid test, the FDA um, approved rapid test, which again means we are getting more test results uh, frequently instead of <coughs> the course of three to five days. We also know that there are a number of outbreaks in food processing plants and in long-term care facilities around in surrounding counties and in our own. And so we, of course, as our residents live here but work elsewhere, um, some of our cases have been in those facilities. Um, the, the number of deaths, um, that we're looking at, we've had just two since 420. So that's, um, we, we could anticipate having more, but um, that is a, we are fairly stable there. And again, we are fairly stable in terms of hospitalizations according to Cape Fear Valley. So we are carefully getting that data as well. Um, and the two areas, again, where we have challenges at the health department and in our long-term care facilities are N95s and gowns. 
And we are getting requests on a regular basis from our long-term care facilities um, for PPE, um, particularly those N95s and gowns. And those are where we also have shortages at the health department. Um, and so we have a, a strategy here where we are following CDC guidelines for, um, for extended use of our PPE, but that's not the situation that we want to be in. We want to use our, our PPE like we normally would, um, but we are trying our best to preserve that PPE. So again, I just want to throw back up that slide um, that we had that increase, that we've seen that increase in cases, and so that's some of the, the reasons why. Um, I'll wrap up by talking, you've seen this slide before, but as a reminder for folks that might be tuning in for the first time, uh, the EOC has been activated and Jean will talk a little bit more about that. We're still doing our contact tracing. We get a number of questions about whether or not we are investigating our positive cases. We are still doing that um, and we are still doing providing testing for those that meet those guidelines. And again, we are working to increase that capacity and we do a number of calls each week with our local and state partners to assess um, um, needs and to make sure that we're collaborating. Um, in recent days, we've done a lot of education and got a lot of requests from businesses about reopening. And we appreciate that businesses are trying to be proactive and thinking now about how they're gonna reopen. So we're trying to do our best to provide some technical assistance and guidance about reopening for those facilities and, and what that will look like for them. Um, so I'll pause there, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Are there any questions at this time for Dr. Green? Yes. Who says yes? yes. Me. Is that Booz? Yes. Okay, yes. Can not see you on the screen? Okay, couldn't see you on the screen. Okay, go ahead, Mike. Okay. Uh, Mr. Four, thank you, sir. Just four quick points. One, again, Dr. Green, thank you for you and your team, however large that's getting to be, on um, keeping us updated and uh, with some accurate information so we can deal with our own community uh, and not worry about Tucson, Arizona, except for how that contributes to the entire nation. But uh, a couple questions. One, on the antibody test. It, so it says, if you had a previous infection, cannot be used for diagnosis, and does not show a current infection. Is that, were all those accurate? Correct. Uh, why would we not waste, but why would we ask for tests for that? I mean, I just, you know, uh, we're already going in and testing folks that, uh, uh, I'm getting reports that are, because we're in a, the Keith nursing home uh, to test uh, Larry and Marshall, while we're there, we'll test some asymptomatic folks, too, since we're there, uh, like maybe a roommate or someone they regularly have lunch with or something. You know, they're, they're, they're a circle of friends. Uh, it seems that the regular test kits would be where we'd want to focus, um, and especially if we're now extending out to uh, non-symptom, uh, you know, non-symptom folks. So... Uh, I, I don't know what, except for statistical purposes, we would need the antibody information. And then number three, um, when you said on co that one screen that said COVID-19, COVID-NC, uh, increasing the number of tests daily, did that include the antibody test or is that just for the uh, symptom active infection test? So, uh, um the antibody test is not included in that five to 7,000 tests a day. Um, and one of the reasons we want to use the antibody test is to think more about surveillance and less and, and getting a true picture of how many people are infected, but not using it for diagnosis and contact tracing to identify um, new cases. So we really would rather use the antibody test to look at um, who was infected can people be reinfected? Um, and is it protecting me in the future and, and from future infections and less about, um, you know, preventing the spread of additional disease because we can't use it in a diag for diagnosis, but we can use it to say, okay, I have it. Um, and then I, I can't get it again in the future and using that for more as a learning and research tool and less about diagnosing. 
Right. I agree with you. I hope it turns out to be something like mumps and measles and stuff that uh, your your body does give you some sort of immunity, if not a complete uh, uh, free pass on it in the future. But that, that's why I was just concerned when you said we need all these test kits and everything like that. I, I, I would, if we were asking for 100, I would ask for, I wouldn't be doing 50-50. I'd be asking for 100 of the tests to find out who is who has the symptoms as the the virus who's 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 possibly in spreading it now not oh well i think i got it from him but two weeks ago he was a little more feverish but he seems to be okay now and then while we're there doing a antibody on him we can take his name and come back uh so uh, I, I love the aggressive uh nature of uh, of your folks and your team getting out there and getting all this done uh but uh, I, I, I would be in favor of putting the antibody stuff as data gathering and future <laughs> immunity kind of information, but not, uh, you know, getting personnel to find out who had it right now. We need to find out who has it and then Perfect. come back to the who had, but Absolutely. anyway, thanks again. Thanks again. And is that your, your slide, is that in a presentation uh, or did you were, were you pulling down from the DHS live right now? Um, both. So the state I pulled down from the county's COVID nineteen page as well as the state health department, um, and I put those into a presentation format. Okay. So Could you? For, I think that answers more questions, and uh, I think that it has more answers than people have questions. It's very very useful. So I'd like to have a copy of your uh, uh, presentation from today, please. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are there, are there any other questions before Dr. Green wraps up? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Green, thank you. Thanks again for the update. A um, couple questions I have is, what is the percentage of <clears throat> Cumberland County residents that have been tested to the best of your knowledge right now? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, one of the challenges is um, in the beginning, providers were required to report all test results to us and they are still required to um, report all positive test results, but we're not getting an accurate count of all of the negative test results, um, especially as people are going to commercial and private labs they are reporting that information more slowly. So we're trying to work with the state health department to figure out how we can get a, a clearer picture of both the positive and negative test results. So that's an answer I don't have right now. What the state health department is estimating, um, they're coming up with some modeling for us so that we can um, on average test about 5% of our population um, and so they're they're come rolling out with a what they're calling a hundred county plan, and so um, we're getting we're going to get some numbers hopefully in the next week or so about how many tests we need to do each day if we were going to do um, test five percent of our population. So the goal is five percent of the population to be tested. Uh, correct, and so that's. Um, that's an estimate from the state. So I don't know what the final numbers will look like or what the final estimate's gonna look like, but we hope to have that here in the next um, week or so. Okay, uh, let me go into that. And I think one of the things you had on your, your, your slide was you talked about why are we having these increased um, numbers? And, and I think the most glaring thing is we're having increased testing because right. um, it, we keep, if we're claiming that people have asymptomatic they may not even know that they have the virus. You know, if, some of us may have it, but um, the more testing we do, we have to assume that those numbers will continue to go up. And I'm just wondering, how do you measure success if the idea of you keep testing, the numbers will keep going up? And one of the things I said, we should focus more on, um, on uh, the hospitalizations but, and you know, I'm as tired as you are about people relating this to the flu or influenza and everything else. But we don't really look at the people that stay at home from the flu or influenza and, and recover. Because it, you were right, the numbers at the hospital are, are actually better than stable. 
um, that they have capacity to be able to treat uh, a number of people as as we've been briefed. So uh, I, I'm just I'm just wondering what success looks like um, in our in our state. And you brought up yourself that we have a hundred counties. Well, in 88 of those counties, we've had less than 10 deaths. So there are some outliers in very rural counties that mostly came from nursing homes or, um, but a majority of them are, are in, in um, higher concentration areas. So, you know, we've always known that, that, that the state of North Carolina was not a one size fits all county for things when you have Mecklenburg County with over a million people and Graham County with under, I think 5,000. So are you, is the state allowing you as the county health director any leeway on, um, on, on any suggestions that we may can do or not do that is particular to our county? And, and leeway in terms, can I get some clarification and leeway in terms of, of what? In terms of the number of tests or the of tracing or? Well, how our population is, is, is infected and, mm -hmm. and, and how each county is differently depending on their density or the rule or, or that. Are they allowing health directors throughout the county to, are some health directors getting more tests than others or is it completely based by per capita or at some time or another, Dr. Green, somebody's going to came, come to you and say, you know, what, how is Cumberland County different than Wake County? Right. And w what are your recommendations on what we can do? Are we just going to, is the idea that every county toes the state line until we're through with this? Or is there any leeway that we might be able to get if the governor were to relax some of his restrictions? Um, I think the both and. Um, so in terms of, um, you know, every, yes, every county is different. And I'm going to go back to your first question about what does success look like? Absolutely. As we increase testing, we are going to increase the number of cases that we have. Um, but we still want what we're what we're going to get now is a better picture of our true prevalence rate and a better idea of what baseline looks like for us so that going into the fall and future years, we will have a better idea of um, what this is going to look like and being, what is our new normal? What is that going to look like? So um, we might not have days where we have zero cases. We might not have days where we have two or three cases. We might always have days where we have 10, 15 cases. We don't know that yet. Um, and so we want to, try to focus what success looks like is we want to either stabilize or um, decline. Um, in terms of what the state health department is, is trying to give us leeway in, in what we're doing versus what other counties are doing of different sizes and populations, we do a weekly call with the state with all health departments. And then we also do a different call with the state health department um, for counties that are larger and also have been highly impacted. And that's where we really get into um, the differences in the counties and they give us some technical assistance based on Cumberland County um, and how do we plan for our specific county, um, being a military, being a college town, um, being very transient. And so we are trying to get, we do get some guidance from the state and then try to get some leeway um, and, and because we are different. Okay. But um, specifically, yeah, in terms of reopening. Okay, I got a couple real quick questions for you too. Um, has the state allowed you to identify people as recovered yet? So that's a, a good question that we get um, quite frequently. That's a number that is hard to calculate. The state and the CDC do not yet have a standardized definition of recovery um, and because when we get asked that question, people are asking different things. So one, people are asking how many people are no longer in isolation or quarantine. People are sometimes asking about um, how many people are no longer hospitalized. Some people are saying, asking how many people have completely recovered, um, meaning they maybe they're not in the hospital, but they're somewhere else in um, 
um, respiratory rehab. So those are all different numbers. And so it's hard to get an accurate account of what does recovered mean. And so we're trying to get some guidance from the state health department and they're trying to get guidance from the CDC about what do we mean when we say recovery? Um, and so that's not data that we have yet because we don't have a clear and consistent definition of recovery. Would it be fair to say then the recovery numbers are not really valid numbers? Um, because there, because it, there's, so, there's so many different aspects of what is recovery. Right. I think there, it's not consistent across the country. It's not consistent in North Carolina. Um, they all mean different things. So if you just say what percent have recovered, if you ask me in Cumberland and ask somebody else in Wake, those are two different definitions. Okay. We, we've all heard time, I'd like to go ahead and move on uh, to uh, other commissioners that have questions. Uh, Dr. What, what, Dr. What, what, are you cutting me off, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please do mute, mute your mic. No, that, that, that is not proper procedure, Mr. Chairman. I know, but we've got other commissioners with hands up. We've got Dr. Green wants to finish her presentation, and we, we, we need to move on. This is a televised meeting, Mr. Chairman, that people would like to know questions to. Thank you. Chairman, thank you. I have waited patiently uh, for this. It seems to me that we are going to need a separate uh, uh, meeting probably for this information. This is a first time thing. We uh, don't have the answers. We all have questions. I've got a list here of questions that I brought with me, but uh, I'm not going to monopolize all of me that way. I'd like to also hear whether or not Jean Booth's presentation, how it leads into uh, Dr. Green, how it affects Dr. Green. Because we can't, there are no decisions that we can make now. They've been made by management already, and Dr. Green, we had your input in that. Thank you. I'd like to know how Jean Booth's presentation okay. affects. Do, Dr. Green, are you finished with your comments? Did you have some I, more slides? I don't have any additional comments, um, but I can, um, if there are other questions, I'm happy to answer. And I think Jean is going to talk some more about the emergency operations side of things. Mr. Chair, I have other questions if you allow me. All right, Jimmy, go ahead and uh, go ahead and finish up your questions, and then we need to move Thank on you. to uh, Jean Booth. Thank you, Dr. Green. There's a lot of COVID-19 in our prison in our prisons, and I just wanted to know if Cumberland County residents who were in the state prison are attributed to our numbers. Um, our Cumberland County residents. Um, from the state prison in our numbers. So we aren't aware of any um, state um, Cumberland County residents that are in the state prison that are counted in our numbers. We're not, um, we would be tracking that, but we're not aware of any that are in the state prison, um, in the state prison system. Okay, thank you, Dr. Green. That, that concludes my questions. I'd like to call on the county manager now to introduce uh, Jean Booth. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We thought it was appropriate, too, because emergency management is a partner in uh, managing, managing this pandemic. And I'll ask Jean Booth, our emergency services director, to give us an update. Good morning, Jean. Good morning, uh, Ms. Cannon. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, uh, Commissioners, for allowing me the opportunity to present to you today. As we all know, March 16th, uh, uh, the declaration of emergency was signed as well as the emergency operations center was open today marks the 50th day that the emergency operations center has been activated and is working uh, to support the response and, and planning for COVID-19 with the planning we schedule a, uh, uh, a weekly conference call with first responders EMS fire departments law enforcement public health we also include our community colleges and other partners in this call, um, such as Red Cross. Uh, this is this, the, during this call, we uh, share our dispatch protocols. They've been ever changing. And the purpose of that, 
ever-changing dispatch protocols is to one uh, add a, that level or layer of safety to our first responders to give them a process to know that there's been questioning um, that we're able to give them a heads up if there's some questions that have been answered that they may be uh, responding to a, a COVID positive call or a COVID um, related call. Um, also, this also gives them the opportunity in these these dispatch protocols to limit the exposure uh, out there. Uh, we also provide updates on matters related to public health. Uh, Dr. Green gives uh, an update to that group, that first responder and, and partner group each week on uh, public health activities. Uh, we also share updates and changes to resource requests and the processes and procedures the state has implemented for that, uh, as well as future operations planning. What, what are we going to need to do down the road? This is a very long, extended um, process and response, and, and you know, recovery is, is very important in this process as well as we get back into that. Um, and it also gives our partners an opportunity to provide feedback back to us. Uh, what what do they need? What are their needs? And what can we? How can we help provide those needs? Um, we manage the resource requests. So there's two ways that uh, uh, hospitals, long-term care facilities, doctors' offices, and counties can request uh, commodities from North Carolina Emergency Management and Department Health of Ser so, uh, Department Health and Human Services. Uh, and that is through either WebEOC or their uh, DHHS's ReadyOps website. Uh, <clears throat> once those uh, commodities are fulfilled by the state, North Carolina Emergency Management or DHHS, then they are shipped here to Cumberland County. Uh, we receive those and we distribute them out to uh, those, those areas that made the request, whether it's a hospital, long-term care facility, uh, medical doctor's office. Um, to date, we've processed 122 requests for uh, uh, items, uh, commodities, in, by the, into the county's web EOC. As well, we've received 66 additional different types of commodities uh, within our, our uh, central receiving and distribution point through ReadyOp to provide, to, to distribute it out. Matter of fact, today, we have over 27 deliveries to make uh, out into the community. What we're, what are we uh, distributing? Uh, we're distributing uh, masks, uh, as Dr. Green mentioned, uh, N95 masks are, are uh, hard to come by. We're not receiving those. The state is uh, basically uh, fulfilling those with surgical masks to have some type of uh, uh, protection there. Uh, gloves, shoe covers, disinfectant liquid, um, are amongst uh, additional commodities that we're receiving. Gowns is low in, within the emergency operations center. Those things that we're not able to get from the state, we're also looking to procure through the EOC uh, out on uh, uh, general market. And those, those areas are hard to find as well with very long uh, shipment and receiving times. Um, in addition, we are engaging in detailed medical surge planning with Cape Fear Valley, North Carolina Emergency Management, and North Carolina uh, National Guard. Uh, we keep a daily status report on hospitalizations, how many are, are uh, in the hospital that are uh, positive and those that are in the hospital, they've had a test and they're awaiting, and also the bed count, and that has fluctuated over the last few weeks. <clears throat> I know we're looking at a, a, a pretty good hospital capacity right now, but as you know, in emergency management, we always plan for the worst and hope for the best. So we still have worst case scenario planning going on with not just uh, medical surge planning, but also fatality management planning with Cape Fear Valley. Um, they, they typically are close to uh, capacity on any given day. We work with them and DSS and, and uh, some other processes as well to try to uh, quickly move folks out. We've not had, as, as you see, only eight so far COVID-related deaths, so that's not been a problem. But they've also been able to uh, keep their numbers uh, a little bit lower than, than their typical. Uh, within the morgue, 
but we also have a plan if those were to suddenly rise, spike, or gradually spike, uh, we have a, a, uh, a morgue plan for that as well. We also are planning with public health and, and uh, our partners for non-congregate COVID-19 care. Uh, and also we're working with our partners at Second Harvest Food for food distribution planning uh, as well. And uh, on my last slide, I would not be remiss if I did not mention that this week is Hurricane Preparedness Week. And amongst all of our other daily duties, we're still preparing for day-to-day -day activities, which includes hurricane season that is just coming up upon us on June the 1st through November 30th. Um, we do know related to COVID-19, what is shelter going to look like? So we're working with our state partners, uh, Red Cross and Public Health and DSS to, to create that picture. What is sheltering going to look like among, uh, during COVID-19 or, or as this is in our, our our area of concern for sheltering and trying to assist social distancing, reduce the numbers in our shelter, uh, amongst other processes and procedures. So, uh, I want to pause there. That's uh, the end of my slides. If you have any questions, any questions for emergency director? I can't see Larry. Larry, you didn't raise your hand, did you? Okay, he did not. He did. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Booth. Does that conclude your presentation? Yes, sir. Thank you all for the time today. I appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Okay, next item, Ms. Cannon. Yes, sir. Item number three is the consent agenda. So is there a motion? Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, please signify your uh, affirmative vote by saying aye. 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 Okay. That is unanimous. Okay, next item, Ms. Cannon. Uh, yes, item, uh, Tristan, will you ask Steve Taylor to come in, please? Thank you. Item number four uh, begins our items of business. 4A is consideration of submission of the 2020 through 2024 consolidated plan, the annual action plan, and the neighborhood revitalization strategy area plan. Joining us this morning is Mr. Taylor. Good morning, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, on the April, at the April 20th meeting of community development along with uh, our consultant, Urban Design Ventures, uh, presented the uh, consolidated five-year strategic plan, as well as the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice, the 2020 annual action plan, and the neighborhood revitalization strategy area plan. Um, and that was presented as well as uh, a public hearing held um, at that meeting. And we also uh, put out the plans for public review and comment for a period of time. People are having trouble hearing you. Oh, oh, okay. Thank you. We yeah. also put out the plans for a 30-day uh, 30, uh, 30 um review and comment period uh, from uh, April the 2nd through May 1st. We received no comments. Uh, the uh, comment period did end on May 2nd, and we received no comments. And in order for community development, uh, Cumberland County Community Development to continue receiving the entitlement funding, um, we are required to submit these plans to HUD uh, by May 15th. Therefore, I am requesting the Board of Commissioners to approve the submission of the plans uh, that you have uh, attached in your agenda packet to HUD. Mr. Council. I don't want to uh, ask for information that's already been given. But, uh, at all, and I know I'm asking a redundant question. If 
people really understand because all of us have received emails and uh, phone calls from people about fun. Where can we get, receive some help? In fact, something is forwarded to you now. That's the next one. That's the next item. This one is the, that's just the for first the plan. item. Yeah, that's this, is just, this is the first item. I know you're talking about people asking about grants and stuff. Uh, that's that resiliency program, uh -huh. which is the next item on the agenda. Oh, uh, I am so uh, sorry. Uh, I don't know. Right, <laughs> completely wrong. <laughs> now, I apologize. Uh, Trisha, you can go ahead and do the camera back over that way, please. What? She was trying to get us in. I uh, saw Commissioner Keith's hand first, I think, through the camera. The camera was in the way. <coughs> Mr. Keith, well, then Mr. Chair, I guess I should ask first if there's a if there's a limit, because this is a five hundred and twenty page document that the first thing I would wonder is why don't we have any questions on it or whether it's getting to the right people's hands. It's a very, very intensive document that actually has changed some of the things that community development has historically been doing over the past couple of years. Some things are remaining the same, but there's a whole position in there about the homelessness project. There's a whole position about blighted areas. There's a whole position in there about a number of other things. The, the yep. geographic, the worst thing that happened to anybody here was I read it because it was pretty, it was pretty in depth about what it is, but what's the measurement for success moving forward? And is it, is it just words on the paper or how do we hold accountable to get these things done? Because quite frankly, we've been talking about homelessness for 10, for 10 years that I've been on this board and I'm not seeing that handshake between the continuum of care and community development and positive performance that goes out in the, in the homeless community. And, and what we're seeing is wins. We can, we can talk about individual wins or we can talk about statistics, but we're basically still in the same position that we were before. I was very intrigued and I appreciate the taking on the Shaw Heights program. Um, every time that you said that there wasn't really blight in Cumberland County, I always had to look at that program and think that area and think that that is a, a, a good place for us to hopefully be able to partner possibly um, with the city of Fayetteville on some level um, on providing some sort of um, not only activity in that area that um, that brings it up to a level that it really deserves. So um, ba based, on, based on all of those, it's a very aggressive plan, but I would just like to know what the measurement purpose is and how do we measure success out of this plan also. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Okay, thank you for your questions, uh, Commissioner Keith. Yes, it is a very comprehensive plan, and that was the idea because we don't really know what the future holds and what the needs may be uh, in the future. Um, but we uh, plan to, each year, we, as we submit our annual action plan, um, that is where we obtain uh, additional input prior to submitting the annual action plan each year. So the uh, projects and activities may change each year. And then at the end of the year, we do look at, and, and that's where we submit our uh, annual performance report and look at how well we did perform in meeting the needs uh, for that program year. And, um, and that's where we determine also if we need to make any adjustments in our current program in order to better serve our community. Um, we look at, we need to redesign our program for future uh, and, and how we can best utilize our funding sources for the future. <coughs> okay, Commissioner Booth. Thank you, sir. Um, my, my question is just that the, the draft was presented to us at April 20th. At that time, it had already been 18 days into a 30-day review possibility by the community. Where was it posted? How was the community noticed? Well, uh, we put a uh, ad, in, in, because at a minimum, we are required to uh, in, in, in a, comply with our citizen participation plan, which requires us to, at a minimum, post it in the uh, local newspaper. 
and we also posted it on our county website. And uh, we normally uh, distribute it out to various locations, such as the town halls. But of course, in this case, uh, during the uh, crisis, we uh, minimized the, uh, the distribution location to just community development office, as well as posted on the county website. But normally, it is distributed out to uh, the town halls, um, our, our uh, plans, as well as our uh, annual performance report. But okay, because to make some other arrangements because of the crisis. Okay, thank you. Because I know several of us have the same people who call with questions over our agenda when they see it posted a topic that's uh, brought up like at this meeting for the next meeting stuff. And to date, I haven't heard a single yay, nay question, inquiry or anything over something that's going to be many, many years uh, planned today. Uh, and then it has on here that the comments, if there were any, would be included after May 15th. So comment, the, the whole planning on this thing is it had already been in review for almost three weeks before we saw it somewhere uh, that for comments and then we were presented it on the 20th we're being asked to approve the 500 plus pages today and then after May 15th we'll hear what everybody said about it. the whole it's it's just all askew uh, for me for exactly how important this could be you know going forward and I'm, 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 I'm on very uncomfortable with that but thank you you can I ask the uh, question, uh, when, when is the deadline for submission of this to the Fair Housing Choice and Neighborhood Development Strategy Area Plan to HUD? It must be submitted by May 15th of this year. We have to submit it by May 15th? Yes. That's yes. today, May 15th. May 4th. We don't have we another have meeting. Enough. We do have, we do. It was the 18th. We meet again May 18th. Except for the agenda meeting the on agenda the 14th. The agenda session on the 14th. Yes, sir. I just had one question. Hey, I, I just did not understand on page uh, 207, we have the affordable housing, because I read through this thing too, mm -hmm. and it says one year ago, the homelessness then had zero, as though we weren't doing anything on the uh, households to be supported. Mm -hmm. But then we come down here and it has 50 households. That just didn't seem, I, I couldn't understand that part. Well, I guess for the affordable housing development, and again, this is just for, oh, okay. and that's for the affordable housing uh, development, and it's just, again, that could change, um, but we wanted to keep it general. It doesn't mean that homeless persons won't be served. But I want your goal to zero. I mean, you have to have a goal. Mm -hmm. A goal to zero is not a goal. When you have zero, to me, that's not a goal. I mean, either you say five and we don't do any, that's fine, but... Mm -hmm. If you don't have a goal, if zero of that, that's, that just doesn't seem to be a goal. To and that's actually, if you prefer, and that uh -huh. is just. Um, right, because the Diane talks about 50, it just didn't, I just can't. Right, the no. actual, the project goes, you'll find on, and I know it's a large document, <laughs> but our uh, projected goal does include the homeless. You can, I mean, you can get it to me. I mean, you can explain it. But I just wanted to point it out. Because that, will here, change, that was just, I just didn't understand that. So I, I'll talk to you. I'll okay. that, that point, I mean, I just couldn't oh. wrap my head around that. So okay. thank you, Mr. Chairman. You should get it to me. May I add something? Mr. Yeah, Keith had a, had a question for us. I saw your hand, Jim. Uh, real quick, um, in response to D, D, while you were talking that, I actually went to the website. I could not find it on the website. Now, maybe it had gotten taken down. I looked at it on a couple different things. And that's not anybody's fault because sometimes it's a little difficult to maneuver through our website. But if we're looking for feedback, and this was really only the only mechanism that we allowed for in this time period, um, I, I don't think we. I don't think you're going to get a true representation. Um, Commissioner Adams brought up something. And this is my. This is the only question that I have is. We're, we're, we're continuing to talk about affordable housing. I've asked about the wait list. One of the things I really want to know, though, is what is the percentage of people that come off affordable housing each year? Well, 
Well, I don't have that answer right now, but you, uh, that's you something. Think you that for me? We have, I'm sorry, sir. You think you could get that for me? Is that is that data available? Uh, we will have to obtain that from the current providers in our community. And okay. um, yes, sir. But to answer your question, we can get that information from board for you. Thank you. Hey, see, just in the past, we really haven't had many comments on this on, on our program going forth. Have we? Even though we did, even when we did it out in the community, right. we didn't have a whole lot. We didn't. This is not no comment. is not unusual for That's us. That's correct. I mean, correct. and uh, even when you went out and did the community things, all That's correct the over the years. position on this is we're picking and choosing who where the meetings are going to be and we're only going to the places that are going to be affected I as a commissioner was not consultant even though it says on the thing that the county government and commissioners were talking. select commissioners may have been spoken to but not all so it seems like we're kind of picking and choosing on who can benefit and who cannot but I, I mean that's what it looks like to me we're going to places where community development is only part, but we're not asking the, the response from anybody else. We, we want it very close. It, it, it looks, if you just take it from the outside and look in, it looks like this was a very close um, area and a very select group that you're looking for responses from. Um, Thank Mr. you. Mr. Chairman, may I add this? I apologize. Uh, but um, directly in relationship to this concern, uh, Dee actually reached out to Candace, and Candace reached out to all of the commissioners about an opportunity to meet with a consultant um, outside of those group meetings so that each um, commissioner was asked if they had an interest in meeting with the consultant. And I believe we had two commissioners that responded to um, the clerk and the clerk set up those meetings. I, I don't. I don't recall that email. And, and let me say, I, uh, Mr. Keith, Commissioner Keith, and, and just so that I, I, I want to be fair to community development, everybody. I went to the one at Smith Rec Center, but if you looked at the sheet that came to us, they held these in every town in Cumberland County. I think except for Eastover. Right. I think they went to every town in in Cumberland County. That's not just one area that was affected. It was the whole. All over community, uh, over Cumberland County, we got that information. We had the list of them. That's why I knew the one that I wanted to go to, which was in my district. Uh, that's what I went to. But this was not a limited number of people. It was everywhere, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make sure that this uh, we've been broadcast. Everybody understands that this was not just a short period of time. Yeah, I think the notice went out inviting commissioners to those meetings, not individual meetings. 
meetings, but inviting them right. to That's the right. meetings. Uh, okay. Uh, any other comments, questions? Are y'all comfortable moving this thing forward? I am. Okay, then let me hear a motion. Um, Mr. Keith is right about the Shaw Heights or, or I don't know if you were on city council or you were a commissioner during the time Will Diddy conducted some uh, meetings. You remember that? With, and, and we always ask some of the similar questions. I have forgotten also that the citizens, as many citizens, were utilized as they were. So no wonder those were the interested people, and they had already had their input. Okay, this comes up every year. Jimmy, you are right. Um, I remember getting a list of those meetings, but you are you're right. You're right. You're right. But I w I don't want to risk our not getting the funds this year. Can we ask Ms. Taylor or that department to put it on our agenda, Madam Chairman, Madam Manager, uh, next March? You mean get an earlier, get a preview of it before it goes? And I move that we. The submission, of, the submission of, of the consolidated this, plan, and we are going to move it forward. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion on the motion to move this forward? Seeing none, please signify your consent by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. that it's uh, passed six to one with Commissioner Moose being opposed. Okay, next item. Item 4B is consideration of the Small Business Resiliency Program Guidelines. Ms. Taylor. Thank you. That's the one you're talking about. That's the one I, I saw. <laughs> so over the past couple months, um, our communities have experienced some economic hardships. Uh, especially small businesses who struggle to maintain the same level of service. And so as you um, are aware, there have been some aid made available uh, from different levels, federal, state, and local government, um, provided to these uh, businesses in mostly in the form of, of loans. So community development even have an existing program, which is called the Microloan um, Small Business Program, that uh, provide a financial assistance to businesses with five or few employees um, with assistance in the form of a loan. However, that program has not been used in the past several years, and I don't really see how that would uh, greatly benefit uh, the businesses that are currently struggling uh, through this COVID-19 uh, pandemic crisis. And so with that said, we the Community Development Department um, reevaluated its current program and tried to come up with a way that we can address the needs of the small businesses in our community and uh, list some uh, certain requirements, some red tape, um, and other uh, uh, underwriting requirements to make the application process um, for any new program a little bit more simple. So therefore, we came up with the Small Business Resiliency Program. Um, you have the guidelines included in your pack, and I hope you had a chance to uh, read over it, but I would like to just go over the main components of that program. So the Small Business uh, Resiliency Program um, is designed to provide um, financial assistance in the form of a grant of up to $10,000 to eligible uh, small businesses with 10 or fewer employees. Now, uh, the amount of assistance will be determined based on the business needs. And eligible costs will include items such as payroll, rent, or inventory, and those kind of things. But because this program is still um, funded through HUD 
Community Development Block Grant Program, there are still certain main requirements that we have to meet and we just cannot get around. So since it is being funded through the CDBG uh, program, the business has to uh, meet uh, what we call a certain national objective. And that is a national objective. And that is they have to benefit low to moderate income okay. employees or, or meet an urgent need, such as a presidentially declared disaster, which I will go into uh, detail in a moment about how they can meet that requirement. The other main component is that um, in order to be eligible, the business, um, there cannot be any duplication of benefits. So if they're already receiving aid from another program for the same type of need, we cannot duplicate that same uh, type of, uh, or meet that same type, provide assistance to meet that same type of need. And then the other uh, eligibility component is that the business has to be located in Cumberland County outside the city limits of Fayetteville. Outside. Oh, just outside the city limits. So in, all the, in our, uh, that includes all the uh, towns of um, all the municipal, eight municipalities as well as the unincorporated areas of Cumberland County. Not the city of Fayetteville. Correct. So these are the main eligibility requirements um, for this program. Now, in order to get the word out, we do plan to use our public information office um, to get the word out to various media outlets, post it on the county website, um, post it maybe on the front page and then in, within the community development web page. Uh, send out the applications to the list of inquiries that we already uh, maintain and work with um, the Small Business um, Economic um, Development Center and get, get it distributed out uh, through that means. Um, <coughs> we're hoping to post the request for application or, or request for proposal. Um, the hope is we're, we're targeting next week and we're hoping to post it for the first, this first round, a period of seven days. And that is just to determine um, how many applications we receive within that period. So we, just in case we receive an, an abundance, we don't want um, after applications to get bottlenecked throughout a certain phase of the uh, application process. Um, so that is the hope, and we, um, and that is the first round. Now, if we, uh, it turns out that uh, we, after determining um, eligibility of the applications and we still have funding available, then we'll go for another round of uh, putting the RSA out. Okay, let me stop you there for questions. Mm -hmm. uh, question I, I, just got, I just got one question. I just got just a couple of comments. The, the, the issue I had was the duplication. How you go? Is, they have to provide that. Who has to provide that? I yeah, mean, they, that's going to be a ticklish kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I got money from um, from the ten thousand. I got money for this. I, I don't want to. So it just it. depends. So, so if they're already receiving a fifth state, like to pay their rent, then they can't. So how, how, you know? the how are you going to find out? out? I mean, we ask that question <laughs> and ask. Okay, we do okay. ask that question. They have to but provide that. You know, okay. and then they have to they have to provide that information. So. That was the biggest thing I had. Yeah. Um, just two, two other comments. Um, can you do, and I think it's always uh, when I go on and look at anything on uh, the Internet, can you do frequently asked questions? And I think that will stop it from, from them calling in. Mm -hmm. If you know what the frequently asked question is, where's the deadline, what's this, what's that, okay. that will probably cut down on the number of, phone calls you get because they can go to that frequently asked question part. That's the first thing. The second part is that, and, and you can talk to uh, the county attorney, is there a mechanism where you can just, you, you set out what this criteria is, is I've been on one that says you have to meet this, yes, and you go to the next question. If there's a no there, you're just out. And that will cut down on people having to fill out a big application, fill out the application if you got four questions that they, everybody has to meet, which was these things you just said, okay. if you have one that says yes, 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 then go to the application. If you get yes, yes, no, then you know not to have to worry about doing that. If that might be a 
way to just kind of help people and simplify stuff. So those two things were two of the things that I thought about when uh, I read that. Just be, considering we're working from home and having to do all of this, that might make your job just a tad bit easier. Okay. Any other questions for Ms. Tyler at this time? Jimmy? From Mr. Chair, first first question I have is probably for legal. Is legal in the office? Is it legal in the building? Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I'm, 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 okay. Um, I, I've heard I've heard for years and years that legal said that we cannot take taxpayer money and present it to in any way, shape, or form to a for-profit business. I I I, I like the program, so. But is this legal? Yes, sir. We're not taking taxpayer money. We're taking a HUD entitlement block grant and making grants that are that we're really contracting with these companies the same way the existing community development, economic development program. They will all be agreeing to maintain at least one employee or some number. And the process works through a competitive proposal process. In other words, if 100 companies or businesses apply for this money, they will submit a proposal as to what they will offer in exchange for the money, and it will be incumbent upon community development to evaluate those uh, and pick the one that this money. Okay, well, it, it, it's, it's all taxpayer money, but what you're saying is we can't use Cumberland County money, but we can use federal money for a program. Because that's what the federal money is for, yes, sir. Okay, all right. Um, Mr. Chair, I, li I like the program, and I got to warn you, I got a couple questions on this from Ms. Taylor. So sure, um, sure. I'd I like to do this quickly. Um, how much of that $509,000 is dedicated to this program? Well, sir, right now I have earmarked 250000 However, um, that, that can change because it just depends on the number of applications. The other portion I've uh, earmarked for public services, such as uh, providing um, like rental assistance and those type of activities. So those, um, the funding can shift between those activities just depending on um, how many applications we receive and how much uh, assistance have been distributed out. But those okay. are the two main activities that have been earmarked for this funding. Okay, so there, the only limit that there really is is five hundred nine thousand uh, dollars. Well, no, well, uh, for right now, but we can change that and, and include our current entitlement. Okay. If I, I think this is where I, this is where I have some concerns as we go forward, and I, I just like your input on this. You have a micro micro enterprise method, and you have a small business method. You you're requiring more out of the micro business person who only has one less than five people you're asking for a self-verification on income for the small business and the only requirement is although they have to have 10 people the only requirement is they retain one person which could be the owner and it's self-verification meaning that they just have to tell you what their income is and you further down the road have a thing that says just because your income is verified at the beginning, it can go up after that. But they also have to be an LMI eligible person, meaning they have to be below the poverty level as the owner of this company. Is all that correct? Yes, sir. So at the time of that application, they do have to uh, certify that they are low, meeting the low mod income. And that, that's not with any verification, no no documentation. They just have to tell you. Well, sir, no, they, they are required to submit verification. It says self-certification. Oh, well, yeah, yes, sir. That's, but they're providing, oh, let me make sure that I'm just reading it correctly. Yeah, I know oh, that you have a provision that you can require documentation. Yes, so we do, we are, we are asking them or uh, other documentation throughout that. Okay, well, the, the, it, all it says is self-certification, which means I say that that's what my income is. Okay, uh, the other thing that I have a concern with, the other thing I have a concern with is they can use this money to purchase new equipment for their business 
or to pay on capital goods on their business. And I, I'm just afraid that that might give an unfair advantage to like businesses who may not have gotten that, um, who not may have applied but not received the funding at the same time, that you have two competing businesses and one can use this money to buy new equipment to give an unfair advantage over another. I thought the purpose of it was to maintain payroll and to keep people employed. We will be looking at uh, each application and we'll, we will definitely look at the business need and scrutinize uh, each application to ensure that the costs are reasonable. Yeah, and, uh, and I promise, Mr. Chairman, this is it, but the SBA had a lot of wisdom when they went through the PPP program about allowing local financial institutions work within these guidelines, as Mr. Adams said before, to ensure that they meet the criteria as, as they move forward. And I was just wondering if there's any consideration to maybe partner with a local financial institution to, to assist in verification and certification and distribution of these funds. Well, that, that, that can be an option. Um, it may just take a little longer because we will have to then uh, post a, uh, a request for proposal and solicit um, for services. But um, we, are, we do have uh, staff, adequate staff, that have experience in reviewing applications uh, such as this. So we should be able to manage implementing this program. This, this has been done under the HUD guidelines and loan servicing guidelines. Um, I know I say loan, this is a grant program, mm -hmm. but you'll use much the same process Correct. for deter looking at the submitted information as you do for loans that you do internally. Correct. Is that correct? correct. Yes. Okay. Well, I had a couple of questions and uh, one of them was answered uh, when you, Mr. Keefe asked his question, how much of the 500 was going for this? And you said 250, so that's what, 25 possible businesses out there. So uh, at, 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 on the first round, if we get any more money, it may be more. Uh, and the other thing, uh, and Jimmy, I, I took self-verification on the, on the financials to mean you, know, you don't have an outside party, like an auditor or something like that, uh, verifying the the number, but I mean, self verification would be for providing financial statements, tax returns, or, or something of that nature. That's, that's how I took that. So I, that's not a, it. Doesn't, it's just not a I say so thing, in my opinion. Um, but uh, I think the idea here is to get this money out uh, quickly to those who need it. Uh, it's, it's basically 25 businesses that aren't located in Fayetteville, but are located in Tillman County. Ben, do you have another comment? No, I was just. Uh, Maybe you finished. Are you ready to move forward? Yeah, but I was, you know, oh, Mike says he has a question. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, just real quick. Uh, I'm glad to see this and especially the focus of not getting overlapped in with the city of Fayetteville because they are doing their own thing. Uh, and the recommendations by Commissioner Adams, I hope that you would take back and kind of do that because it will save you and your staff a lot of time. Instead of filling out a five, seven, ten page application, sending it in, and then finding out that some uh, eliminating uh, criteria, you know, do the thing that if there's four things they have to do, are you are you an LMI? Are you that you know? Uh, and then if it says yes, yes, yes. Then it says okay, here's your application. I think that'll save a whole whole lot of time. Um, and uh, somebody already asked about how do you check duplication if it's not through you? And that's going to be an issue on. Uh, somebody's going to start reporting that uh, Glencoe uh, got the same grant. We both we both make widgets, and I applied, but I told you about something else I got, and I got thrown out. And I know Glenn gets the same stuff from me and that I do, and he got the loan. And suddenly you're going to get a report that says Glenn's getting separate money. We both get down and got it the other day. Uh, so that's going to be an issue. So the stronger you can put in the duplication monitoring will be the better. And also, who decides? Is it a person, a panel, a group? Is it uh, 
uh, a CPA firm? Is it a financial institution? I mean, it says on there that these decisions, I anticipate being more than 25 businesses. So let's say we get 125 businesses. Who decides? Is it first come, first serve? Is it most need, most needy by uh, a panel vote? Uh, and then my last question is, is when is the data on this, the success and the disbursement of these funds due back for review? Uh, you know, once we send it all out there, is that the last we're going to hear about it? Or will we hear in six months or a year that the money's out and we saved 25 local businesses? Uh, I'd like to know when the follow-up is. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Booth, for those questions. Now, as far as who decides, that will the selection um, com committee will consist of the community development staff as well as uh, representatives from, um, I've already asked uh, a representative from the Fayetteville uh, Cumberland County Economic uh, Development uh, center to sit in on the review, um, but initially when the applications are uh, received, the community development staff will go through those applications first to determine eligibility and ensure that um, we have a complete application, that we have all the documentation that we need to move forward with the next step of determining uh, how much assistance will be provided. So initially, the community development staff will go through the applications to determine their eligibility and make sure that it is a complete application. And then the selection committee uh, will determine uh, the amount of financial assistance that um, have been approved, that was approved the amount of financial assistance was this. Does that answer your questions, Mr. Booth? And then as far as, I think you had a question about the turnaround time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which that will really depend okay, on. Okay, and then the report. It does. It does. The, the report. You're breaking up, sir. Say that again. <laughs> yes, that's true. Okay. The report back time. Like, when are we going to, you know, because if this turns out as good as it, as well as it could do, we, we should really get behind this going down further down the road. Uh, you know, so I, I like to know when the report back time is to say it worked. Yes, sir. Um, so, of course, since this is uh, somewhat a pilot program, we're hoping after this second, this first round, uh, we, if we, if needed, we can uh, use that to determine if we need to tweak our our current program uh, guidelines, or we can we can continue to move forward with uh, the current guidelines and uh, do a second round. But that's what the, why we're breaking it uh, up in, into different uh, phases. Um, Thank you. The turnaround time, yeah, that would just depend on, um, again, we have to uh, monitor it periodically. And uh, we can provide that information, update you, um, just like we do with other programs on a monthly basis and let you know how the program is doing. So we can provide that report to you on a monthly basis as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further questions uh, for Ms. Taylor? Are you all ready to? Uh... Mr. Chair, just one thing, and, and I think you answered it. She should have said yes, but I don't think they saw her, that tax returns and is yeah. part of that. Right. Mm -hmm. Somebody text me that, well, the tax returns be to you. That mm -hmm. She was shaking her head when you said that, but I don't know that the audience saw yeah. that, so that answers that question. And, you know, I said the, uh, I want to thank the commission and, and staff uh, because I think we sent out, commission sent out about uh, some kind of grant program for the community. Thank you for stepping up, D, on doing that, and and uh, the manager and Mr. Holder, who's uh, working with uh, community development to meet that need in our community. So I would uh, move to approve the Small Business Resilience Program uh, pursuant to the guidelines. Second. Sir, second. second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Uh, uh, signify your affirmation by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That is unanimous. Okay. Next item, Ms. Kim. Super. Item number five, you have a nomination to the HHC board. This time I call on Commissioner Council for this nomination. There are two vacancies, both the 
eligible for reappointment, Paul Crenshaw and Tammy Graham. I nominate Paul there, Crenshaw and Tammy Graham. Are there further nominations for those vacancies? Being none, we'll move to uh, appointments, and I'll call on Vice Chairman uh, Clint Adams. Um, Mr. Chairman, for the uh, Board of Health, um, there's one nominee, and I move to appoint Hakeem, H-A-K-K-A-M, Arcelia, A-S-A-L-S-A-I-D-I, uh, for the appointment. Okay. Okay, moved and seconded to appoint uh, the stated uh, Person for employment. Uh, any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Any, I'm sorry, any opposed? No. Okay. So the, then we'll take the Community College Board. Um, there's one uh, nominee, and I move the appointment of Charles Harrell uh, for reappointment to the uh, board. Is there Second. a second? Second. Move to second it. Uh, any uh, further discussion? Not signify your reformation by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That is unanimous. It's unanimous. Okay. Do we have a closed session? No further business, yes, sir. I okay. move we adjourn. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That is unanimous. Motion. I mean, it is adjourned. Thank you. Oh.